What made you switch from Trump to Nikki Haley? The man is a lunatic. And I think he's terrible for the country. What are you thinking about when you say that? Just that he lies, he cheats, he bankrupted millions of businesses and people, and I, I don't see anything good about him. Let me ask, if Donald Trump is the nominee in November, do you support Joe Biden over Donald Trump? No. America is speaking, well, one American at least, saying Donald Trump is terrible, but she still won't support Joe Biden. Huh. So what happens now? Is Biden capable of flipping the Nikki Haley voters? Or will they come home and vote for Trump since he's the Republican, vote third party, or just stay home? Joining me now is Sarah Matthews, former Trump White House Deputy Press Secretary. This is the puzzle. Uh, thank you for being here, Sarah. Because I, I've heard tons of these. Um, that The person says, there was one person who said that literally called Trump a lunatic. But then when asked, okay, will you vote for Biden? They said, oh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, and, and in the end, they sort of came back to, if it's down to the two of them, they'd still vote for Trump, who they called a lunatic. What does Biden say? What could he say to get that person who thinks Trump is terrible to vote for him? Look, exactly. I think there are going to be a fraction of these uh, Nikki Haley voters who are going to have a tough time supporting Joe Biden. And I would say to them that, look, I have never voted for a Democrat a day in my life, but I have publicly stated that if my choices are Trump versus Biden, that I would be willing to put policy aside and cast my vote for Joe Biden for democracy. And I think that Joe Biden needs to lay out that case tonight in his speech, because democracy is under attack right now. If the thought of Donald Trump being able to be our leader again. And I think that he needs to spell that out tonight and uh, make that case and appeal to those voters. And I thought that Biden smartly responded when Nikki Haley dropped out of the race by saying, look, there's a place for you in my campaign. Um, to her supporters, because Donald Trump, he said that anyone who supported for Nikki Haley would be, quote, permanently barred from MAGA. And so he clearly doesn't have any interest in trying to win over their support. But even if Joe Biden is able to win over a fraction of those supporters, then this election is going to be marginally close. And yeah. those people could be the deciding factor. Talk, take us inside just a little bit, because, again, you worked for uh, Donald Trump. But of course, it was, you were January 6th was like, yep, that's a no for me. Uh, and, and, and wisely, I think that you decided democracy actually matters more. But I think you had a breaking point, right? But for but, but take us inside. What is it about Joe Biden, who, for those of us who've been observing him for a long time, is a down-the-line moderate. He's not even a progressive. Their progressives are not happy with him and his Gaza policy, et cetera. So he's definitely a moderate. What is it about Joe Biden that enrages Republicans so much? I think there are a lot of Republicans right now who kind of view the state of the country as um, not great. And that's evidence in the polling and Joe Biden's approval rating. They say that the economy um, isn't doing well. Obviously, we know that there are metrics that shows that the economy is improving. Mm -hmm. But I think that when inflation hit its peak in 2022, people are still recovering from that. So maybe the effects of the current economy just haven't trickled down yet. And so I think Joe Biden needs to kind of uh, keep making that case that the economy is improving. I think he's got some time between now and November that the economy will get even better. And so hopefully that will bode well for him. But then I think they these Republicans also look at issues like um, immigration, and they haven't been happy with his leadership on it. And to be quite frank, I haven't been necessarily happy with his leadership on it. I think he had three years to do something about it, and he kind of avoided this issue. And now when we're seeing it's one of the top issues for voters, obviously he tried to um, strike a deal with House Republicans, and they shot that down because they want Donald Trump to be able to campaign on this issue rather than find a solution, which is really disappointing. But that's why I'm hopeful that tonight and um, um, Biden's State of the Union speech, that he will use this as an opportunity to hopefully announce some executive action on the border, because I think that that could be a way to appeal to these types of Republicans who are not really wanting to support Trump, but might have a hard time voting for Joe Biden. So we know that uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is getting on more ballots uh, sort of around the country. And it's not even clear who he hurts more, whether it's, you know, people who are anti-vax tend to, 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 to support him, but progressives who thought maybe supporting him, he's to the right of Joe Biden on, on things like Israel. So it's sort of it's not clear who he would attract is it, because it does feel like a lot of this is Team Jersey stuff, right? You're either a D or an R. It's like being a sports fan and you just only vote for your team. And so even if your team person is terrible, you're like, well, yeah, but they're not the other team. And so it feels like that's some of the way Americans vote. Is there a possibility that that is where Nikki Haley's voters go? Because he doesn't seem to really fit them either. But is this a situation where people would rather vote third party 
than vote Biden in your view? I think there will be some people who vote third party. I'm not sure if Nikki Haley supporters will go there. Yeah. I think what we're going to end up seeing, though, is probably just a lot of people leaving the top of their ballot blank or mm -hmm. maybe writing someone in. Yeah. And to those people, I would say that I, I would encourage them to vote for Joe Biden, even if they don't agree with the policies. I think that the threat that we face as a country of uh, Trump is so unique that we need to be able to put partisanship aside and save our democracy, because that's quite frankly what I'm worried about. If Joe, if uh, Donald Trump is elected president again, it will be the end of our democracy as we know it. He has said that he would be a dictator on day one. He has said that he wants to install loyalists across the government to carry out every wish and demand. There wouldn't be people of good character to push back on his worst instincts. And so those people should probably, um, instead of wasting their vote on a third party who would never win, vote for Joe Biden. Uh, I hope that a lot of people listen to you because our democracy genuinely is at stake. Coming from somebody who worked for the man, that is serious business, y'all. Listen to this lady. Sarah Matthews, thank you so much. We appreciate you. There's this question of embryos. In the process, they are destroyed, disposed of. If you believe life begins at conception, fertilization, and I know you do, do you see that as murder? Um, it's something that we've got to grapple with. You know, it's a brave new world. We support the sanctity of life, of course, and we support IVF and the full access to it. We do believe in, in the sanctity of life. And if you do believe that life begins at conception, it's a really important question to wrestle with. But you didn't answer it. <laughs> that was House Speaker Mike Johnson hedging on what IVF means for those who believe that life starts at conception. But what he was clear about was that this is not an issue Congress will be taking up. Joining me now is Robert P. Jones, president and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute and author of The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy, and Irene Carmone, senior correspondent for New York Magazine, who's working on a book about the broken system around being pregnant in America. Irene, my friend, did you understand his answer? And what is the, how do they fix this conundrum? Because if you think life begins at conception, then once you freeze the babies, you have to keep them, you have to use them. You know, um, there's a lot of strategic vagueness, and we know the reason why they're being so vague. They're, this is the logical conclusion of their position. As our old friend Tony made very clear, if you truly believe life begins at conception, um, as Mike Johnson, soldier of the Christian right, certainly does, uh, you will be concerned about things like freezing embryos in ways that they may not survive if you thaw them. That is something that routinely happens when people have multiple embryos. Um, you, you, if you really drill down to what he's saying, he's saying he supports IVF, but wants to restrict it so profoundly that it would leave many families suffering from infertility with very few options. And the reason that he's hiding the ball, of course, is because everybody knows that this is a deeply unpopular position and they were caught off guard that the natural conclusion of their restrictions on abortion, contraception and beyond uh, have now been staring everybody in the face in a way they can't hide. Right. And, and the thing is, you know, uh, Robbie Jones, is, is that the, the, the problem is, is that they want the Handmaid's Tale. And it turns out the Handmaid's Tale is very unpopular. <laughs> Even if you haven't seen the series or read the book, no one wants to live in the Handmaid's Tale, but they want the Handmaid's Tale. And I'm old enough to remember, you know, even when I was in high school, school, the, the far religious right believed that IVF was demonic <laughs> and they didn't believe in it at all. And so they have to now hide that too. But, uh, but let's, let's talk about um, this gentleman, uh, Mike Johnson, because he's not just a Christian right member. He's a Christian nationalist. Tell us what is Christian nationalism and how is it driving the politics of Republicans? Well, thanks, Joy. You know, yeah, I think in that clip we saw a really great example of, you know, the Louisiana two-step uh, in action <laughs> trying to kind of get around, um, you know, the obvious contradictions here. You know, but, but Christian nationalism um, really is this idea, you know, that America is a country of, by, and for Christians, and particularly one kind of Christianity. Right. I mean, it's very clear, too, that it really is the group that's most pushing this uh, and the group that's most representative is the group he's a part of, white evangelical Protestant Christians. Uh, we at PRI just did a, a big national study, and about three in 10 Americans qualify as uh, Christian nationalists, either adherents or sympathizers, those who believe basically these views that the U.S. law should be based on the Bible, America should declare itself a Christian nation, et cetera. Um, but when you look at white evangelical Protestants, it is two-thirds of that group uh, who believes that. When you look at Republicans, it is 55% of Republicans uh, that adhere uh, to this worldview. And it just so happens that with the topic we're talking about, 
they're also one of only a couple of religious groups in the country uh, that believes uh, that abortion should be illegal. This is not even a religious secular issue, really. Most yeah. religious Americans today actually support uh, the legality of abortion, including Latino Protestants and white, I'm sorry, Latino Catholics and white uh, Catholics uh, in the country. Um, you know, if you look at uh, uh, even even among white evangelicals for whom I'll stop on this point, but even even among white evangelicals, 72 percent oppose the legality of abortion in most cases. But even if you even among that group, if you ask how many Americans support a total ban on abortion uh, in, in the country, um, you know, it is less than one in 10. It is 9%. Yeah. Um, and even if you look at uh, white evangelicals themselves, it's only 17%, yeah. one seven, uh, even of white evangelicals uh, who say they want a, a complete and total ban. So he is way out in left field here, not only with the country, right, but with his own constituents. Right. But the problem is, Erin, is that the way that uh, that the that power is distributed, it's disproportionately distributed to rural Americans or disproportionately falling into this group. And the Senate gives them a lot of power and the House at the moment is controlled by one of them and a lot of them who, who adhere to it. And it is interesting to watch them try to message around this because IVF is for affluent women. So they're afraid that affluent women will actually vote. <laughs> they don't care about poor women who they're forcing to have babies that are conceived through rape. They don't care about that. They're scared of the rich women, the, the affluent women. But when it comes to overall women, there is this now push to play this baby Olivia video. It's a video that gives misconceptions about pregnancy and about when pregnancy um, actually produces a viable, uh, when, it, you know, when this is a viable um, fetus. They want to play it in schools. So what you're now seeing is a sales job. They want to convince women that, oh, no, 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 you want to live in The Handmaid's Tale. You know, there is a broader agenda here, even though um, theoretically, you know, they're saying that they support IVF. IVF also, when it is accessible to people, puts the power in the hands of individual families and women uh, to decide when they're ready to have a baby. Um, the broader agenda of we decide when you have a baby is undermined when people feel like they can plan their families, whether it's to have an abortion, to use contraception, or if they have infertility, to try IVF, if they have a series of miscarriages. There's yeah. lots of reasons why people have IVF. So I, I, I think ultimately what ties all of this together, and for the same reason that tonight at the State of the Union, you're going to have Brittany Watts, a woman who was criminalized for having a miscarriage. You're going to have Kate Cox, a woman who was denied an abortion in her home state of Texas and was forced to travel, even though she had a non-viable pregnancy. I think what ties it all together is this fundamental system of control and who is in charge. And a very small, undemocratic core of people would like to be in charge and take yeah. that control out of the hands of people who can reproduce. Yeah. And, and, and it is always about controlling women, y'all. It's never been about babies. Because if it was about babies, they would actually be in favor of, I don't know, school lunch <laughs> and, you know, health care. But they're not. Thing and Robert, mortality. There you go. Uh, Robert P. Jones, uh, we're going to have to have this conversation again. Robert P. Jones, Erin Carmel, thank you.